something that is a crisis in our state. View from the top. The Senate will be in order. Hours to go before session, Florida's Senate president right here. Obviously, you can tell I'm not real happy with the president's performance. The congressman on the committee. South Florida focus on communist China. Balloons are just the beginning. They actually woke people up, you know, to the threat that China is. The big dig. It is the crown jewel of Everglades restoration. The Everglades Reservoir, decades in the making, is underway. Will it work? There's really a debate going on about what is the purpose uh, of higher education. Florida schools, political makeover. Ross go away! And a backlash. The view from Next Gen in the thick of it. Big news of the week and the newsmakers this week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. Hours away now from the start of session, we begin with the most powerful woman in the Florida legislature. Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo presides over half the GOP supermajority, already voting through plans that alter the landscape of education, gun culture, housing, public safety, all while the governor seems to head toward the presidential campaign trail. We talk about it all one on one with Madam President. I mean, there's so much work that has already been done going through committees. And I want to start out with, I know, something that is your priority. And I will tell you the priority of every single local and state official that we talk to, and that is affordable housing in the state. And, um, and you've done so much work on this already. There's a, there's a unanimous vote in every committee your affordable housing bill has gone through so far. That's pretty big in Tallahassee at the moment. Frame for us, it looks like the headline that could be on here is incentives for private development. Is that, does that sound valid? Yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say. The bill is uh, a robust bill. It's 100, 106 pages. That's a small piece of it. I would say the headline for this bill is what we're calling it, which is live local. Um, and, and what that means is we have to find a way that we can provide, uh, and when I use the word we, I mean it's a, a collaboration of local governments, the state, uh, housing, uh, Florida housing, uh, and developers, and just communities as a whole. We need to provide the access to safe affordable housing for the people who work in our communities and how we do that we have a myriad of provisions in the bill that um, address that one of the provisions yes is incentives to developers to provide housing at lower than a market rate and the incentives include things like if they're building now We'll give them uh, sales tax breaks on the materials they use for the to build the housing. Um, Ad valorem tax breaks for those units that are at the lower rate, and obviously they would be paying uh, uh, market rate um, taxes on market rate units. There are a number of those, but there also are a lot of incentives and encouragement to local governments to participate. For example, we are uh, asking local governments to speed up permits and to allow multifamily residential in commercial areas. Uh, Miami is the perfect example. You have you, many of your transportation corridors, not just US-1, um, have uh, lots of strip centers on them that are, in many ways, some of them are vacant, underutilized. You know, located next to banks and office buildings and hospitals and the like. And wouldn't it be great if, if we could renovate some of those properties to build multifamily residential so that the people who work in the banks, who work in the, uh, in the office buildings, that work in the uh, hospitals, could walk to work because they could live local. So the bill has all kinds of provisions like that. So I want to, that, that's a very interesting thing to delve into for the moment, because it's almost, if anyone who's ever lived in a big city where there's a very robust mass transit network, it, walking to work or, or being very close to where you work is kind of an urban thing. But there's, in right. the bill, there is, um, there's a component about preempting local zoning rules. And I want to talk a little bit about that because 
That, that means preempting local decisions on height or density, which sounds like it might be very valuable to do what you are talking about doing. But the flip side of that coin, I'm going to guess, are, are local governments on behalf of residents really raising red flags about what that might mean. First, first we are not preempting zoning at all. That's, that's not what the bill does. We encourage local governments to, um, to do things like density bonuses and the like, but we're not preempting uh, local zoning ordinances. Um, we are asking the fa fast track changes that they make and things like that. Um, so I think that's a misunderstanding of what the bill does. I, I, I think you, do, you did allude to something that is something that we as a state need to do, whether through local governments, um, uh, through the business community, uh, is we have to change the narrative and the rhetoric that what when you use the term workforce housing, you are not talking about um, crime ridden uh, projects that have, you know, green buildings with graffiti, you know, the things you think about from 1980, what we're talking about are homes for the people who we work with every day. Uh, first responders, nurses, teachers, um, secretaries, the people who cut our hair, the people who uh, fix our cars, the people who work with us and for us. Those are the people that we are targeting. We have created a provision in the bill called the missing middle. And those are people that make too much money to qualify for some of those affordable housing uh, projects that uh, we have today. And they don't have enough money to, to, to live. In Miami, the median home price is $600,000 for a not so nice uh, house, a teardown. Well, how could a family uh, that makes it even like our missing middle the number is like six ninety six thousand dollars a year that sounds like a lot but you can't afford a six hundred thousand dollar house for that so what we want to do is to to incentivize developers to to uh, build projects to target those people and so I, you bring up something I, we experience in Miami-Dade and Broward increasingly in southwest Florida where you're from your you know development there there is income inequality has settled in so that you have you know subsidized housing in three or four or five blocks away from gazillion dollar condos on the beach so the other component to those home ownerships it would be the cost of property insurance the cost of windstorm insurance uh, taxes and the like is there a component that would help people who are going to be now able to afford down the pike these homes in these developments you know is that going to be cost prohibitive for them as well well the insurance issue is is a real issue in our state uh, we passed a robust insurance bill in december uh, that we hope will um, go a long way to rein in some of the the, the practices uh, of uh, some of the trial bar, a very small number of the trial bar, by the way, that um, have a practice of uh, suing insurance companies for fees and the assignment of benefits issue and one of the attorneys. There's a lot of a lot of provisions in that bill. Uh, we are hopeful that uh, with time and hopefully not a long time, as I've, um, I'm going to keep my finger on that pulse there, uh, we'll make inroads and bring down the cost of insurance. Uh, we have to do that. You know, there's no there's no uh, magic bullet to get this done. There are so many issues. The framework in this bill is the actual housing itself. Uh, you know, we, we look at the insurance from a different aspect. There are a lot of other uh, things to look at as well. School choice for all. No more concealed weapons, permits, and assisting the governor's run. We pick up there when we come right back.
across the rotunda from you, House Speaker Paul Renner is HB1. We've discussed it on this show a lot. The, um, the bill, pretty massive, that essentially would make uh, school vouchers available to all, universal vouchers. Um, we actually discussed it this week, um, last week on this program. $4 billion is the estimated cost, but according to the state, the, the costs are indeterminate. And I wanted to get, I know the Senate has filed an identical bill. I just wanted to get your take on um, what would be really a, a sea change for public education in Florida when this is passed? Well, first of all, um, I don't know where the $4 billion came from. Uh, yeah, I think that's something that was floating around. And, and uh, we've gotten some preliminary numbers and they're still working on it and it's nowhere near $4 billion. That being said, uh, the, the concept of the bill the policy of the bill is a good policy, and, and that is, and the speaker feels very strongly about this, as I do, that parents should be able to determine where their students go to school. And so opening up uh, this whole voucher system, very simply, the money follows the student. Now, here's the one thing that, that I'm adding to this whole mix, in that Throughout the years that I've served in the legislature, I have been hearing from our school um, uh, districts that the legislature continues to pile on provision after provision in law of requirements. And, and they're right. Since I've been there, since 2010, every year we pass three or four bills which have requirements on the, on the public school system to do things, whether it's hardening issues, um, structural issues, um, uh, curriculum issues, um, all kinds of things. And when you look at it and it, it's added up over time, the, what I hear from superintendents and teachers are, we don't have time to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic because we're so busy teaching all the stuff you make us teach. So I've added a component to the bit. And so here's what their argument is, and it's a good argument. Why are you imposing all these requirements on us and you're not imposing them on the uh, charter schools or the, the, the private schools? So we have a choice. Do we impose all the, the, the um, requirements that we put on the public system, on the private system or the uh, public charter schools? Or maybe better, why don't we reduce those regulations and those requirements? So the bill has, we started with a number of, of provisions on things that we are saying you no longer have to do. And we are going to ask the Department of Education to spend some time over the summer with um, school um, superintendents, uh, uh, school board members, te uh, teachers, parents, you know, stakeholders to go through the code. And it's about this thick, it's huge, of, of requirements on them to determine what can be uh, deleted. And I think that'll level the playing field uh, between the uh, private schools, the public charter schools, and the, uh, and the uh, public school system. And it should go a long way to uh, make a better relationship. Yeah, there's a lot in this bill that, that really attempts to level the playing field. I guess the essential question is, you had mentioned that the money follows the student. Um, I think Speaker Renner called it like a health savings account. You take your money, you go where you want. Um, and I guess the essential question is the 8000 a little less than $8,000 per student that Florida allocates. Are, are you concerned that that will almost defund public schools, you know, if the parents choose that in a neighborhood? Well, it, it, why would it, if you, ha if you have uh, students that are not in the public school and they're in another school, then you don't have to provide the services to them that you uh, previously did. I, you know, I think it all should work its way out. Um, I think the speaker is also looking at uh, making sure that the public school system is, is made whole. And, um, you know, the bill, the bill has some really good uh, goals. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to get across the finish line. It may not look the same as it is today, but, uh, you know, if you keep your eye on the, on the, um, the, the mission, which is, parents having the ability to choose the educational opportunities they want for their students. Get, getting it across the finish line, is there any doubt anything's going to fail to get across the finish line? There's a super majority in both houses. You know, I, I'm glad you bring that up. Here's the thing. Yeah, we have a super majority in the Senate, but we are a Senate family. 
And every single member of the Senate is important to me as president. I, w I will not, and I have not, lorded it over the, the uh, Democratic senators because they are part of the Senate. <coughs> Excuse me. Every one of us was elected by about 600,000 people, or we represent excuse me, 600,000 people. And whether we have a supermajority or not, we treat each other with dignity, respect. And you know, we, at the end of the day, we go home to our constituents and said, this is what I've done for you. You know, I will tell you, we have only met electronically today, but everyone I have ever met, including friends of mine um, in the Senate on both sides, say you're good people. They echo all of that. So. <laughs> well, I'm just old. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Okay, wait, we got more work to do here. Hold on. Um, I want to talk about the, the permitless carry bill. That actually morphed into public safety as the new title in the Senate, and there were some components of school security added to it. Let me tell you the number one criticism I hear from people, including uh, gun safety instructors who are members of the NRA, who say they're very concerned about the absence of a training and competency aspect to this. Okay, so, you know, that's a really good point. And I raise that with, a you know, some of the sheriffs I know, and um, Sheriff Galtieri told me that what is actual training that they do now? Now, some people who want to learn how to actually use a weapon will go to a class and they'll do all the right things and they'll go to a shooting range and they'll, they'll do, you know, take the, read the course and the book. You can get a, uh, a permit by taking an online class, and you know how those things are. And then for the shooting part of it, you go to some place where they have a barrel and you shoot one bullet into the ba barrel. That's not true for me. No, so, but wouldn't that be a, a great argument for adding to the bill some components of, of better training requirements? I, I think it always goes the other way. So um, for me, the important part of that bill is the uh, public safety provisions. That was uh, uh, something that I have been talking about for a long time, and that's my focus. I think uh, with regard to permitless carry, uh, I absolutely believe that when, um, that the government, if, if you're looking stri a strict interpretation of the Second Amendment, that you don't need permission from the government to carry your weapon. That's, but, you, the, the government can put reasonable restrictions, but you don't have to get their permission. So that's where we started. But then I, I started to look at at the whole bill in itself, and I and I had been thinking about the school safety issue for a long time. And I said, well, I'm not going to put it in the bill because we have to protect our kids, and um, those provisions I think are absolutely necessary, absolutely the right thing. And then the last thing that kind of came up from Sheriff Wood from um, uh, Ocala, Marion County, was the dog program that I absolutely love. And I, I, will, I stand by those provisions. I think they are fabulous. And I, and I hope that everybody supports the bill because of those. You know, it's universal. Every time we run a dog story, everyone tunes in, ratings go sky high. <laughs> well, so, did you know, you know what it does? It, it's really very interesting. <laughs> these dogs, these dogs are trained to uh, detect weapons and ammunition. They're actually being and, used. That program, I, I think, is in effect in a Broward High School. I want to say yes. Deerfield Beach High School. Uh, yeah. I have heard that. Yeah. So they, the sheriff brought, brought one of them up, up to uh, Tallahassee, and he came in, and he, or it was a girl. And I was petting her, and we were just having a grand old time. And then the sergeant came in, and of course, he carries a weapon. Uh, concealed, of course. The dog stood at attention, and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, and 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 the thing about that I like about it is I can imagine uh, the, the the dogs become part of the the school, and the whole program. The, the, the kids could name the dog. That could be, you know, the relationship between law enforcement and um, the students can be cemented through the relationship with the animal. And yeah, I'm really 
that's, about that. That's really nice. Um, in the short time we have left with you, there's a lot to talk about. I just want to, yeah. I know, I know you, you have things to do today, I'm sure. So um, I, I just want to, I feel pretty comfortable now that the governor's on his book tour. We were with him this week. Uh, he visited Miami. Um, I feel kind of comfortable saying we expect him to file to run for president. And so with that said, um, will you be supporting changing the law, the resign to run law to allow that to happen without the governor resigning as governor? So uh, two things about that. Uh, there is some discussion about whether or not it needs to be done. Uh, the uh, member who sponsored the original uh, bill way back when believes that the intent was not to require it. But in an abundance of caution, I would have no problem doing that. And honestly, I don't care who the governor of the state of Florida is, uh, whether it be a Democrat or Republican, the governor of our state, if the governor of our state decides to run for president, that is a huge deal. It would mean a lot for our state, no matter who it is. Uh, so I would support that. Secondly, we have a, a good system. This is not like uh, a member of the legislature uh, running for Congress uh, or for the U.S. Senate, because if they if they resign, there's nobody there to take their place. and We have to do a special election. In our case, if the governor uh, runs for um, the president, we have a lieutenant governor from your neck of the woods who immediately can step in and is, is uh, eminently qualified very involved, can take over right away. So you don't have to do a special election and, and all that that, um, that entails. So I, I don't see any downside with making sure that if whoever our governor is wants to run for uh, president, they don't have to resign because they are a governor and they should be able to stay there if they, don't, if they decide not to or they don't uh, make it through the primary. Our thanks to the Senate president and next, Everglades, money, politics, add water and stir. Finally, the groundbreaking for a giant water bowl in the river of grass, decades in the making. Stay tuned. The formal name is Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. It's a giant water bowl and one project planned to unleash the potential of decades worth of other Everglades restoration projects. The multi-million dollar reservoir finally broke ground last week. Will it live up to expectations? Eric Eichenberg is president and CEO of the Everglades Foundation. Eric, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Glenna. Good to so see you. I feel like we have been reporting on this for my lifetime almost. Well, okay, a couple of decades at least. We've covered bridge raisings and other restoration projects, and this was always the unicorn. So what came together to finally break ground? Well, we had a number of years where we were seeing um, disasters, unfortunately, occur from Lake Okeechobee, where, where the lake would rise. And the only option is to open the gates east and west to the St. Lucie, which is near Stewart, Martin County, to the west, uh, Sanibel, Fort Myers, Lee County. And it would have a devastating impact because of the water is polluted. And all that polluted water east and west, then not having enough fresh water flowing south, as we saw in 2015, 50,000 acres of dead seagrass floating in Florida Bay. The system is out of balance and Everglades restoration is reconnecting Lake Okeechobee down to the Florida Keys. This project now, Glenn, as you point out, 22 years in the waiting will be that crown jewel of connecting the lake down to Florida Bay to store clean and send that water south. So this was not only about water quality, because we remember the green gunk and the fish kills, and that really bubbled into the public consciousness. But it's so it's about water quality, but also quantity. And so this reservoir, $4 billion is now the price tag. And uh, just to headline what's been going on for a couple of decades is a push and pull of all the stakeholders, big ag and the sugar needed water, the environment needs water. So will this smaller, I guess smaller and deeper version do what everyone is hoping it will do as a, as a reservoir and as a, a tank to hold and let it flow when man wants it? No doubt it has to, it needs, it's that new opportunity to send water south and water quality, Glenna, for the Everglades is non-negotiable. You have to send clean water south to the river of grass under the beautiful bridges along Tamiami Trail. 
this reservoir will enable that opportunity to have water, not just for uh, a time when agriculture or sugar, and I point out that they will receive a third of this water when this reservoir is built, but to have the fresh water flow throughout the course of the year. And when we have water flowing through the Everglades, it recharges the aquifer, the Biscayne aquifer, which is the water supply now for almost seven and a half to eight million people in South Florida. So we get caught up, some, some people get caught up on the size of the acreage of this uh, reservoir itself. It's the volume. 120 billion gallons of water will flow south to the Everglades and make no mistake about it, that water must be clean. So how, how does the reservoir then assure the water is clean? How does that work? Well, there's about 50 to 60,000 acres of wetlands. I like to call them the kidneys of the Everglades that are in the Everglades agricultural area today. That's south of Lake Okeechobee, uh, primarily used to clean up big sugars uh, water that comes off those uh, cane fields. Uh, this reservoir will have an accompanying kidney or a filtration that will then uh, effectively remove the phosphorus and the nitrogen that's in the water, the pollutants that we see on the east and west coast that cause the environmental and economic harm. And and if, if, and it's a big if, but we have time to play this out, if there is an issue where the water is not cleaned or there's a question about the cleanliness of the water within this reservoir, there are tools in the toolbox to ensure that additional lands are, are, ta are used, I should say, additional lands are used to effectively send that clean water south. You know, the um, we, we've actually talked about this over the years. The In our divided times when the us versus them rhetoric is on full blast, it seems, environmental issues and the Everglades is just something everybody gets behind. The governor has, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but easily over a billion dollars. And, um, and the Biden administration, I know, has its share of it. Um, it but this is this without opposition? Well, you're right. This is a unifying issue. We all need water to drink, and it is a it is a it is an issue that brings both parties together. You mentioned Governor DeSantis, um, who has committed now 3.5 billion over the next four years. That's on top of a historic investment over the previous four. And then when we're in Washington, working with folks like Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Lois Frankel on the Democrat side, uh, you mentioned the White House. It is a unifying and. Uh, my political mentor, Clay Shaw, uh, from South Florida, who was the author of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, he made sure 20 years ago, 22 years ago, that it, it made sense to have this be a unifying issue. And the bipartisanship within Everglades Restoration runs deep. And we need to, we need to stay the course. These next number of years, the funding out of uh, Washington, out of Tallahassee, back to this reservoir, this critical project must be built. We need both both federal and state government to step up in a big way to get this project over the finish line by the end of the decade. And you are such an effective advocate for all of this. So what what is the timeline on this? Well, they broke ground on the on the 23rd uh, of February. The, the dirt is moving out there within the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. The Army Corps is responsible for the construction of that project, uh, scheduled to be completed by 2030. The good news is the state is responsible to build the kidney, the filtration marsh that's uh, 6,500 acres that will complement this reservoir. That will be completed this September. So the state is ahead of schedule on its portion of this project. Now working with our congressional delegation and other members of Congress from around the country. This is America's Everglades. This is a national treasure. And we need all members from the uh, U.S. Senate and House to step forward as they plan the budget process over the next number of months to give robust funding to this Everglades Reservoir. And Glenna, the good news is President Biden signed legislation last year that now makes it a national priority. These funding dollars are going to flow quickly, we hope, over the next number of years. Eric Eichenberg, President and CEO of the Everglades Foundation. Keep in touch. As always, great to have you. Great to see you. Thank you, Glenna. All right, next in South Florida, talk of communism or socialism usually involves Cuba or Venezuela. China became the focus this week with a South Florida congressman in a leading role. Florida lawmakers increasing attention to China and the Chinese Communist Party. And then came the balloons, and that amped up that attention. 
This week, the new House Select Committee on China met for the first time. And why is that local news? Because Miami Congressman Carlos Jimenez played a prominent role there. Congressman, welcome aboard this morning. Thank you, Glenna. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. So last year, the director of National Intelligence, even a year ago, said that China presents the broadest, most active and persistent cyber espionage threat to U.S. government and private networks. And that was even before the balloon. So the, the issues that you're looking at go way beyond. What, what was your takeaway from that first meeting this week? Uh, the takeaway was uh, that uh, we have a bipartisan issue that we can rally around, both uh, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, all the members on that committee pretty much uh, have, are in agreement that China poses a, a significant threat. And to me, actually, China poses the greatest threat of my lifetime uh, to our safety, to our security, to our freedom, not only here in the United States, but around the world. Explain a little bit detail why, I mean, that's a very strong statement considering that over the years the U.S. has faced significant threats from other places. Yeah. Detail that uh, for me. Well, because China actually has the economic um, power, might, to actually carry out its plans. Uh, the Soviet Union was a first-rate military power, but a third-rate economic power. Uh, the, uh, the way that, that we defeated the, the Soviet Union basically was economically, and so they collapsed under their own weight. China's a different, bit, uh, different kind of thing. Uh, China is the second largest economy in the world. They're gaining on us, um, and they're using uh, our strengths against us, the somewhat semi-capitalistic system, but more and more so, they're becoming more, more of a central centrally controlled uh, economy, which I, that I think will actually work in our favor. But right now, China is uh, building their nuclear arsenal at an unprecedented rate. They're building their military at an unprecedented rate. Their Navy is already is trying to become a blue water Navy. Uh, they're building uh, defensive systems that can keep us at bay uh, militarily. And then economically, what they're doing around the world is basically actually they're eating our lunch, uh, especially down here in South America, their investments, uh, the things that they own uh, are, you know, with an eye towards the future. I'll give you one example. You know, 70 percent of the rare earth minerals actually lie in South South America. Well, China owns 80 percent of them. And so uh, our natural resources from this hemisphere are actually flowing to China so that they can make uh, solar panels and wind turbines. The problem is they don't use them. They're powered by coal, and they continue to have more and more coal-fired electric plants uh, every every single week. They send us the stuff to be to be green. They end up being dirtier every single year, and so yeah, they're a significant threat to us. And then their their philosophy, what for what they really want, they're a Marxist society. It's a communist party. And their, uh, and their wish is to dominate the world. Simple as that. So you, let's take those two things, because usually when we hear the lawmakers who take a very hard line toward communist uh, governments, um, what is not involved in the calls for, I, I think your word was decoupling and, um, and sanctions, what's not involved mm -hmm. is such economic ties. And, and is the U.S. dependence right now on supply chain and those, those minerals that you talk about that are very much a part of technological components that the U.S. Mm -hmm. needs, that, that makes it a much different kind of issue to deal with. Yeah, it does, and it makes it more difficult because look, uh, the Soviet Union was our greatest adversary, you know, in the in the seventies, eighties, et cetera, and but uh, we never had those close economic ties with them, all right? And that's one of the reasons why they, at the end, they collapsed because they could never keep up with these uh, economically. We are we are tied to China, and that's why we have to decouple. We have to uh, incentivize companies to come back to America, or uh, at the least, come back to this hemisphere. Uh, and and so either onshore or nearshore, that uh, that supply chain that we need. This is not going to be without pain. But here, Glenna, the problem is every dollar that we spend on a Chinese good or service, et cetera, is another dollar that's going to be used against the United States. Another dollar that's going to be used to, to dominate the world. And that's exactly what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. And so the good thing again is that both Republicans and Democrats are, are we are united, we see the threat. We may have some differences of opinion on how we deal with that threat, but we see the threat for what it is. And America has to be united in this effort. If not, 
uh, by the year 2049, which is what uh, the Communist Chinese Party wants, they're going to be, China will be the dominant economic uh, power in the world, and they will be the dominant military power in the world if we don't unite here, face the threat, and uh, and combat it. Because I don't want my children or my grandchildren living under a world, in a world, dominated by the Chinese Communist Party. So, so what is, are there clear goals at the moment, or is the committee charged with actually coming up with some goals? No, the, the, what we're going to do is investigate and see what, what is China doing around the world? What are their business practices and how are they basically cheating? They don't they don't really follow the rules, you know. And so, you know, uh, they're part of the WTO, but they really don't follow the WTO. And, and so the, the Chinese model is basically the, um, uh, the, 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 the party controls an industry. They feel, well, we want to dominate that, so we will we will uh you know we will uh, invest in that and we will make sure that that particular industry dominates the world and then once everybody else all the competition is gone they're going to focus on something else this is what they do look they have a thing called called uh belt and roads initiative all around the world uh investing heavily in south america in africa and uh and other places uh getting the materials that they need the raw materials that they need they're they're looking at establishing bases around the world um, and they're establishing a blue water navy. All of that is to confront the United States of America and, so and its allies. And so we have to make sure that we and our allies see the Chinese Communist Party for what it is. And it's not going to be an easy fight. And I don't want, I don't want it to be a hot war, but we better start taking the steps so that we can start to decouple and hurt them where it hurts them most, which is economically. So we will hopefully from you get some really um, big insights from those committee meetings. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that, Congressman. It's my pleasure. Take care. Okay, up next, the voices of the next generation. By now, it's clear Florida's education is getting a makeover from curriculum to books and the people who preside over it. For Florida's conservative supermajority, it's a primary. For many who feel marginalized by those moves, it's a fear. And we're taking that to those who are actually there in the schools. Voices today from our next generation. Jaden Donfronio was president of Voters of Tomorrow and also worked for a number of state Democratic lawmakers. And Ian Lares Chassin is president of the College Republicans at Florida International University. And it's really great to have you for our conversation because you are living it. And, um, and sometimes people read headlines and think, oh, this is terrible or oh, this is amazing. And you're the guys there. So I want to start with um, Ian, let's start with you because when when the laws were crafted last year, the, mm -hmm. the first new education laws, you have parents' rights, the ones that um, people dub don't say gay, even though that's not what the bill said. Yes. And you had a new way of, an altered way of teaching race and history. Do you see any effects of those changes yet? Uh, not quite just yet, to be honest. There is still quite a bit of political bias, I would say, in, uh, in the education system, at least for my uh, political science majors. Which way? Um, Politi left. When you say you, you think there's a political bias in this system, which yes. we which we hear as one of the underpinnings of the reasons for these new laws. So, um, Jaden, uh, you are a liberal person working for Democrats, and Correct. and um, do you see that bias? I don't see any bias whatsoever from uh, my perspective and really the rest of our generation's perspective in Florida, as we've seen. Well, you're sitting next to somebody who doesn't I, I, think I, like you. Not as a generation, as a Which whole. Which is so but beautiful because we can talk about this all, right? It really is amazing. Yeah. And and what we see, uh, for example, on February 23rd, when we saw so many students across the state walk out, there is a massive um, disliking towards the governor's policies and trying to take out. Which, which is exactly my question. The, the policies and what you see in the headlines, do you feel a change or is it the perception and fear, which is very real for m many, many people and very well placed, but is, is the change apparent in what you're learning right now? I mean, we're six months in. Absolutely. We're seeing books about African-American history ripped out of our libraries across the state. And the governor is, uh, and school boards across the state are trying to propel this type of behavior um, while most of our generation is vehemently against this, as we saw on February 23rd, as we saw um, with so many different protests across the state that continuously um, occur. So Ian, um you, you, you saw the protests, you saw the yes. walkouts, you're hearing, you know, your colleague, your friend sitting next to you. 
Um, I'm not sure I have seen titles of books ripped out of, to, to your, your, use your words. Um, I do know titles that were removed from schools based on a parent's challenge. What, what do you see when, when you hear books are being removed from schools? I, is that okay with you? Well, I guess it depends on the uh, content of the books themselves. There are quite a, at least while well, I was in high school, there were quite a lot of books that I read that had a very clear uh, left-leaning bias. When you said, what, what do you mean by that, left-leaning bias? Like what, for example? Well, they would, you, uh, you know, say that all the institutions in the United States were based on racism and that uh, it's still racist and that, you know, people of color and that sort of still, uh, and that sort of thing still can't, uh, you know, elevate their position in society and that sort of thing. So you don't, you don't see racism as a, a, a teaching tool? Uh, well, it's not, uh, of course I see it as a teaching tool, but not to the degree that is, it is being implemented to where everything is considered racist. Do you, um, so Jaden, when, I, I, when you hear that, what, what, do you understand where that perspective comes from? Do you understand someone who says, um, well, what the law says is that teaching race shouldn't make someone feel uncomfortable. That's, that's sort of the words out of the law. When you hear someone uncomfortable about that, what's your perspective? It, it makes me happy because that's where we are as a society. It's unfortunate that um, racism and slavery is such an important fabric of our society because that is literally what the history of this country is based on. And in order for us to move forward as a society, we have to confront that. We have to move forward and acknowledge our past to make sure that we don't commit to that past once again. But race and slavery and the history of the United States is actually part of the curriculum in Florida schools. Correct, correct. But one of the biggest things we're seeing, um, as I mentioned before with books, is that pieces of books on African American history are be being taken out of our classes based off of teacher challenges, based off of school boards, and we also saw our governor um, limit the implementation of AP African American studies in our, in our classes across the state. And it was a terrific opportunity, especially as myself being a high school senior, for us to take these classes to get credits, uh, to understand history within our state and across our country, but instead we have a governor that doesn't believe in conservatism in the fact of a status quo, but rather taking us back a hundred years and ignoring the history that we have. So Ian, when you hear that, do you understand the fears that people who are opposed to what's happening, do you, do you hear those fears of being erased? Yes, I do understand it, but I just don't think it's a lot of people quite understand what's happening. Ron DeSantis, from what I'm understanding, generally just wants to take out the political bias and the political ideologies that are being taught at these schools, a lot of which is very biased toward the left. Do you think a political bias or political ideology is an objective term or a subjective term? I mean, I'm going to guess if I asked you both, is this, is X a political ideology or a fact, you probably would have two different answers. <laughs> Well, yeah, but it's because, you know, both sides really aren't being seen. A lot of professors, at least in my university, um, especially for the political science majors, they are very politically biased toward the left. A lot of, you know, my members at the College of Republicans... So how did you turn out so conservative if you've been taught by so many people with a left-leaning bias? Well, because I started doing my own research, really. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I grew up as a, as a Democrat, pretty much. I used to love Obama as a kid. But um, I never, I guess, really had very uh, democratic values. And I kind of started to realize that as I started to do more of my own research and that sort of thing. Do you ever think, um, Jaden, that you might do a lot of your own reading and, and become a different political animal? I, I always try to remain open to everything. But when I have a governor and a party trying to eliminate African-American history, I don't see myself switching towards any other side. It's unfortunate that we are in this you know, time and place where we can outright just try and eliminate uh, such an important fabric of our society. Um, I want to teach you both something right now. TV time is up. Now we got to go. <laughs> That's how fast it goes. You all are amazing and I'm so glad that we get this, you know, voice of people that are in the thick of it on the program. I hope you'll keep in touch. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you very much and we will be right back. Thanks so much for being with us. Remember, keep in touch.